it was built out of his care to help people. I know no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to talk about the care inside of Michael Jackson. This is the thing. But he just said to me, animals are the only people he could trust. Secondarily, he felt he could trust kids more than grown-ups, but in the long run, it turns out kids turned on him too. He was so upset by how the, the sheriffs ripped apart his bedroom, kind of ripping things apart, looking for incriminating things, which they didn't find. And to turn it into something ugly, it, it was really sad how they tried to paint Michael in a bad way. And he only asked me three questions. Do you know where any of Michael's animals are? He was rude. He was arrogant. He's a freaking idiot. And I have no respect for that person. He didn't give a damn about how those animals were taken care of in the right way. Is this another attempt to find Michael as a bad person? Yeah, again. And then turn it into something full of lies and bullshit. None of it is fact, it's all fiction. Just another example of bad TV. It's totally a blatant lie. They should pull the documentary. Welcome to the Matt for that show. Today I've got two special guests and I wish I could be talking to them on a more of a positive note, but I, I'm very protective of my history and my own reputation, and I'm very protective of my friends. And as you're all aware, I spent a lot of time with the late superstar Michael Jackson as his personal bodyguard, and as a friend too. Bodyguard first from around about 99 to 2004. I was never on the payroll, but I did it because I like the guy and we have mutual friends in common. He was probably the most caring man I've ever met. He was good friends of my family. He was um, wonderful to my children and uh, even to my mother who passed away sadly in, two th in 2012. She had breast cancer and when he heard about it, he made the effort to give her a call pretty much whenever he could all around the world and was such a caring guy. And I think we've all just got a bit tired of, of hearing negative stuff about uh, our friends. So this podcast I wouldn't normally use for talking about uh, anything to do with Michael. Me giving interviews about Michael, I kind of hoped would stop now, 12 years, pretty much after we lost him. Um, but clearly this needs to be thought about, about what's going on here. I thought the negative documentaries would have stopped with Leaving Neverland, which rocked the whole world, literally. Um, I think people have seen through that one though now. But I've got two special guests here now who uh, who took part in the documentary, Michael Jackson's Zoo. And I just want to add, before, why I feel that I'm, I'm kind of um, want to interview these gentlemen is that I was almost talked into taking part in this documentary myself by a production company, um, a gentleman called Harry. And I have the texts on my phone to prove it, as does Rob. I know he's got messages too. But I get messages all the time about taking part, can you take part in a Michael Jackson documentary and so on. I don't really want to do that anymore, but this guy was persistent. This producer, producer was really onto my case about, this would be very positive for Michael. I can assure you, this will be incredible. His love of animals, how caring he was as a person. Uh, I just you know, sat back and thought, I don't buy this. How can you make a, someone, as someone who's been to Neverland has seen the zoo, it's not like a big, Californian zoo type thing. It was his own personal collection. It was nothing like that was made out. And I did say to him at times, Harry, you do realize it's not like a massive, huge zoo that we're talking about. I don't know how you can make a program out of this. What's the story? What's the angle? I'm very suspicious. And the other thing that made me suspicious too is that it's prime time. And to be prime time on TV, on the biggest channel in England, ITV, is special. And you have to have an angle to sell your documentary into something like ITV and get them to fund it and fly. They wanted to fly me to Neverland. They wanted to fly Mark Lester, Michael Jackson's uh, best friend. He played Oliver Twist in the original movie to Neverland. And me and Mark, Mark spoke and we thought there's something not right here. You know, we, we would love to go back to Neverland, but we're not Michael not being alive then. Well, that might be a bit strange, but to talk about his zoo is just like a minor part of the whole the whole thing just didn't didn't add up with us. So I declined to take part in the program because I asked Harry, some, who's the producer, producer, some tough questions about edit, copy, 
Rob has been promised all sorts, edit, crop, copy, about uh, all kinds of different things. And I've been there before. In the Martin Bashir documentary, I was only, I was one of other person was with me, um, the two other people were with me, when Michael was getting pitched by Martin Bashir to take part in the ITV documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, which turned out to be this disastrous for Michael. And when he pitched Michael, it was, this is going to be the greatest thing ever for you, Michael. This is, we're going to clear up all the rumors about your life. We're going to focus on the, your music. And we're not going to fo focus film your children, because that was a concern of him. I don't want my children to be filmed. I want them to have a private life. And, it, and he got out a note from Princess Diana, which has been well talked about now. Back then, no one would believe me. It's, now it's come out in the public. And it was handwritten notes thanking Princess Diana, because he did a documentary on Princess Diana a long time ago in the 90s. And it turned Diana's image around. It, and it's thanking Martin Bashir, says, you know, in a nutshell, saying, thank you for everything you've done for me. Um, you kept your words, you're wonderful. Now, Michael was friends with Princess Diana. So when, when he was handed that note from Martin Bashir when I was in this meeting at the Renaissance Hotel, it was on a Wednesday afternoon in London in 2000, so I remember very clearly, he was sold. And there were three people pitching for the documentary. So David Frost, a guy called Louis Ferru, and Martin Bashir. But of course, he wanted Martin Bashir because he wanted the Princess Diana guy. And we know now, because the case has been lost by... by by, um, against Mike Bashir, and his name is mud around the world here, that there was some manipulation that went on there to get people to take part. So that's why I said to the guy, before I take part in this, I want ITV to apologize and Bashir for what they did to Michael Jackson, because it's just been found out, the timing was wrong, just been found out that everything was wrong about the Princess Diana one, and I wanted them to investigate Michael Jackson, because I knew it was wrong, and we tried to work with Michael to get statements given to try and get the program stopped to have something called an injunction against the program and i gave my evidence to a, a lawyer i still remember her name she's called michelle boots um she's based in london but unfortunately we, something happened legally either we never had enough time or michael may have signed something i can't quite remember and the program went went out and it devastated michael you know he was in miami and he was waiting for a proof copy to be delivered by VHS, by Martin Bashir, Mar Martin never turned up. And he was calling me, he was calling Yuri Geller, and then his assistant got involved, and a panic went on, and they realized then that the documentary wasn't gonna be like we thought. I mean, I was only in my 20s, young 20s back then, so I walked out of that room, along with the other two people who were present, thinking, he's just gonna, Michael's just gonna wrap this guy in legal agreements and lawyers now, because he's the most powerful man in the world. I didn't know how it all worked back then. I understand media now. But it turned out that that didn't take place and that was devastating. I didn't think this would happen, if I'm honest with you. I thought this documentary would never come to light. And sadly, Rob was trying to do something positive for his, his friend, his late friend. And um, it's kind of backfired. And Larry, I know you were trying to do something positive. For, you had the evidence that you've been to Neverland in 2005. Of, of what was there and what was true and what was not true. And it came a bit of a shock in the last few days. Uh, obviously, we've been privy to some information now. They've come, said, oh, by the way, it was going to be positive, but because of this, this and this, now we have to go against our word in a nutshell. Um, which is, I don't, now, we don't know how much Ross Kemp knows about this, by the way, as it stands. We've got no idea. Oddly enough, he's due to present me with an award next month at an event, for what I believe. Now, I'm not going to go to that event now if this documentary turns out to be the way it's being described, um, which I, which, I, which is my initial suspicion, that uh, it seems that the narrative seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, that Michael Jackson abused his animals and neglected them. That's the, that seems to be the narrative of the programme. Not a positive Michael Jackson cares about his animals and, and they've cleverly twisted. So, Rob, shall we start with you on... Um, how you, you got connected with this first and, and what you were told by Harry, the producer, and, uh, and, and also you're known as the man of the maker of the dreams. You put together Michael's vision of Neverland and you made this with Michael. You became very close friends with him. And you took no money from him whatsoever and um, were extremely loyal to him. And you wouldn't be with me now taking time out in your afternoon if that wasn't the case. So I appreciate you giving up your time. I know the fans will appreciate this honesty as well because for us to speak out against him has to be something quite serious. And we're, we're very concerned about this, aren't we? So, yes. Rob, I'll hand it over to you. <clears throat> yes, I uh, started with Michael in June of 1990. And uh, uh, 
we had a wonderful relationship. Uh, of all the people I associated with around Neverland, uh, I'm the only one who had wonderful dinner parties with Michael at his home uh, and other guests like Marlon Brando, people like that. Uh, I was, the ranch was open to me to come and go whenever I wanted to. Uh, I was the only person given permission by Norma Stikos at MJJ Productions to bring my personal camera inside Neverland. Uh, incredible honor that I never abused to take photographs of our work to document what Michael was doing as he created his Neverland dream. And uh, I never signed in or out or anything when I came and went and I could stay as long as I want. One time I took my current, the wife that was current then uh, out there for two week vacation. I mean, that's the kind of relationship we had and enjoy the, uh, the uh, features and activity, horseback riding in the park and stuff like that. We, we would talk hours on the phone about different rides and what his dream was for bringing these children up there, especially like Make-A-Wish Foundation and share things with them that they had never seen and experience things they'd never experienced. And you know, our focus was to accommodate, especially the handicapped, terminally ill, and underprivileged children. So many of the rides we put in were specially modified for Michael so he could put handicapped children on them, even wheelchairs, like the train and the carousel had wheelchair accommodations. And uh, we started in June of 1990, and we opened the first phase, inaugurated on evening of October 31st, 1990. And Michael never quit. After that, he just kept adding and adding and adding. I think eventually he put in 18 rides up there. And I think that's a good point, Rob, is, is that people, obviously Neverland has got a lot of bad publicity. And, but no one wants to talk about the reason why he got it. Of course, he wanted his own world behind the gates because he used to say to me, whenever I leave the boundaries of a hotel map or whenever I leave Neverland, it's like going to work. He's autographed. Right. He's got pictures of people screaming at him and being dragged everywhere. Right. But you you put across an important point there that he had everything adapted to handicapped children. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'll just mention to you because it might jolt your memory. The movie theater. So what did he do to the movie? And I've seen it in my own eyes. The movie theater. So what's he done there in order to help handicapped children? Because it's something well, quite he, impressive when you're there, isn't it? Yeah. He, I mean, you talk about like the bedrooms that he put in there where they oh, could yeah. go up and lay in a bed and watch the movies and things like that. I mean, Michael was very sensitive to children with needs and he wanted to accommodate them in everything he did. And that was, that was a top of his priority list. Well, can we accommodate handicapped children and, or turn, you know, anything. Okay, you want no one wants to talk about the caring side of Michael Jackson. This is the thing. And, oh. and, and how many, I know roughly what he told me, but how many thousand children do you think would pass through Neverland? I don't make a wish foundation. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Exactly. Yeah. He, he was bringing busloads of them up there, especially on Fridays, inner city children from uh, East LA. And I'd see him out there in his backyard. He had put, mounds out there covered with grass so they go out there and roll on these mounds and could have water balloon fights out there and then we put in a, the the he had the water uh the water fort where we put like a water balloon launcher and water cannons so they go out there and have water fights and stuff like that he was fascinated with that kind of stuff and uh i mean his <laughs> imagination he used to get me with the guns, the Nerf guns, with the, the war guns, you know, the ones that back yeah. in 2000, and I used to come out of the hotel and he used to score at me, get me completely saturated. I think it was yeah. hilarious, you know, and get the other bodyguards. He was driving so, around his golf cart there at the ranch with one of those go by and employees and just soak them and just right off laughing, laughing. <laughs> the, the other thing, too, Rob, as well, which as a friend of his, I understand, and, and, and I, I get it. The public may not understand, and I don't, we'll get to Larry in a second. He'll be able to expand on it. That they, when you're at Neverland, 
people think, oh, he's meeting all the kids. Oh, he's out there all the time. He's on the amusement park. No. You, you hardly saw the guy. The, yeah. guy. the guy was a reclusive. Because yeah. unfortunately, he was so famous, even staff would want to speak to him. And, 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 and although they're not supposed to, to tell their friends, we spoke to Michael. I spoke to Michael Jackson near the fairground right today and so on. There was a few people who had privileges like yourself and Big Al and, and so on. I don't know if he likes being called Big Al, does he? But that's what he's known for. And uh, he's very connected to the fans. But there was, you, you would rarely see him. And when I would go there, you see him at dinner time and stuff and you could get him on the phone. He was quite happy just to be in his private space in his bedroom and just let everyone go. He didn't come out and spend all this time with all the kids and things. And, and do you know what he said to me once about his children? He limited Prince and Paris, and obviously Blanca was a baby then, to access to the fat ground ride. Only so many hours per week were they allowed. So right. they had some kind of normality. They, could, they just weren't going on the fat ground rides and around on the go-karts whenever they want. They had a couple of hours per week. He was very strict on them on that case you know and yeah but he was it was built out of his care to help people i know no one wants to talk about that but he's not sitting around on going on fairground rides all day long nor is he which people see this this program is trying to protect project michael jackson zoo nor was he mucking out the animals and knowing what's going on all the time he no. he was it was for him to go down and spend time he used to say to me animals are the only people he could trust because they didn't talk behind his back, they didn't screw him over, and he trusted them. But he paid, he paid a lot of people to manage those animals yes. and paid managers to manage it for him. Yeah. He He's busy writing music, dancing, rehearsing. In your era, Dangerous Tour, I'd imagine, and you'd see him coming in and out from the Dangerous Tour. Michael Jack, we used to have this running joke, me and Mark Lester, it cost a lot of money to, and I won't disclose it, but it's like, you know, Rob, how much it would cost to run Neverland. Oh, but God. he would... He was never at Neverland. He was never at Neverland. He was on tour. He was busy with music. He was in LA and he didn't like the drive from the city to the valley because it's a long way and it's bad roads. And it's uh, he didn't like helicopters too much. He wasn't a big fan of them. But he was quite comfortable in the hotel. So people think, oh, it's Michael Jackson's home and it's strange he's busting all these kids in and there's a zoo there. No, it's, it's, it's one of many homes that he had. Right. Uh, and, and he found it hard to settle there. But that, that was not a private zone by any means, was it, Rob? I mean, go into can you go into some detail on the how vast and large it is, and also his house is quite modest, I must add. And then Larry, you, I, I guess you've seen when we talk, they talk about his bedroom, his stay in his bedroom because we have to address it. I don't want to avoid the subject. I mean, that bedroom is a two-story thing. That's the size of like it's, it's double the size of a normal house in England, right? And, and Larry, sorry, sorry, I'll let you speak. Right, right. sure. <laughs> well, yeah, so uh, I was asked to document Neverland and I had free reign to go anywhere I wanted at Neverland, uh, including his bedroom. So I, I went to the bedroom. There's the upstairs bedroom area. Uh, when I was there, he had a, a, a cradle right next to the bed uh, for blanket at the time, which showed what a doting father he was. Uh, but then there was the downstairs part of the bedroom with the arcade games and all types of things, different bathrooms in the in the master suite and so forth. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, you say uh, that he said that animals were the only ones he could trust, and maybe that was correct. I, I think secondarily, he felt he could trust kids more than grown-ups. But in the long run, it turns out kids turned on him too, mainly because their parents were behind the kids turning on them. Anyway, uh, any specific questions? Well, you, I, I just Would you describe that as a normal bedroom to a house, Larry? I mean, would it no. be normal for him to stay in there all day and hang out and have his privacy? Right, was, certainly uh, he'd have uh, everything he needed in his bedroom suite. Uh, when I went to Neverland and I was there off and on for a month in uh, 2005, uh, I never actually saw Michael. Uh, he was apparently on the premises, but I believe he was staying in one of the guest cottages where uh, Elizabeth Taylor or Marlon Brando stayed. And my understanding was he he was so upset by how the, the sheriffs ripped apart his bedroom, his 
his uh <laughs> the mattresses and and everything and there's photos of it that even the sheriffs took of them just kind of ripping things apart looking for incriminating things which they didn't find um but at that time uh he then stayed in the guest room he just couldn't face going back to his bedroom apparently but you know he was just you know he's a child at heart and uh i was too and that's probably one of the reasons we bonded so well and uh wow. You, you know, one thing I saw in the bedroom, um, there were a lot of uh, VHS tapes and DVDs. But in addition to that, there were lots and lots of books in the bedroom. And Michael was a voracious reader. And one of the things the sheriffs were looking for apparently was pornography. Right. And Michael had something like 20,000 books. And all they could come up with was a couple of art books that had some nudes in them, <laughs> like all art books do. Uh, so it, it was really sad how they tried to paint Michael in a bad way. Yeah. It's so, funny you say that, Larry, because uh, we were in London once and there's a specialist shop that sells books on art. And you're right, that creative art, sometimes people are naked in the artistic stuff. Because a lot of people don't know, as well as being a good singer and dancer, he's also incredible at art, drawing. And he had a, yes. he had a bunker which he used to go to. So this shop, he didn't want it shut down. He just wanted us to turn up with him and it's specialized in books based on art that's all they sold and we, we only had a short amount of time so he turned up with michael jackson in london we go to this shop and he's browsing through the books and he puts four or five in the car and we were running out of time we had to get an airplane out we, we had to go that afternoon so i go up to him and in public i'd call him mr jack i said mr jackson we really need to get get moving and he goes hmm okay <laughs> he said can you can you tell her that i'll take it all I said, yeah, sure. You mean these four? So no, I take everything. We said, what do you mean? So I take everything. We just send it to the ranch. So you, you want to buy the whole bookshop? Yeah, of course, no problem. And it was, it was, it was a modest bookshop, you know. It must have had a good 10,000, 15,000 books on it. And I said to Michael, I said, Mike, I can't go up to this, this lady at the till, uh, the, the uh, cashier, and tell you that you want to buy every book here and clean her out. He goes, okay, I'll do it. He goes up to her and he goes, hi. They said, I have to catch a plane because I'll take everything. Is that okay? And this person the hand of the bill and I send it to the ranch and, he get, and uh, they gave the address. And, he, and she just looked completely shocked that someone just booked every, the best day she's ever had in business, every single book in there because he never had time to go through them because we were on a schedule. And then by that time, word of getting out on the street, there's paparazzi outside and so on. And we, we had to get moving. But yeah, his, his love of books, the artistic side, is um and i remember that day very clearly because we came out and there was a big um big like piece of art on the wall and it was our children that weren't that well dressed on this in this bookshop and it was it was for sale for like quarter of a million pounds and he and i, I said to michael why would i be worth quarter of a million because i never understand it he said i don't understand why people would pay that and you know for an artistic piece and you can see he never had an interest in children he had an interest in the artistic nature right. and his piece was getting off. To, I don't know where this bunker is. He never told me, but he would get. You probably know. Robbie, he would get off to this bunker, like an airport thing place, and he would have a painter, uh, uh, someone who who would mentor him, and they would draw for hours on on different art. And that was his way of, of relaxing and so on. But yeah, I mean, I mean, that paints the picture of how caring is and what Neverland was really about. Let's get into the zoo, if you can even call it a zoo. What would you describe it as? Um, let's go to you, Larry, because you come from a very independent point here, where you didn't know Michael personally. You probably feel like you you know him now, having been to his place and 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 uh, had that privilege of being trusted to film and so on. So you went to film there as an independent person for the 2005 trial, when Michael was found not guilty of everything. It was all complete nonsense. Um, do you want to explain how you how you found the zoo and would you describe it as a zoo? As yeah. This, would, would it be a topic of a documentary one day did you think did you think that would be the case or think it's a bit strange <laughs> well so when i was hired to document neverland i certainly knew of michael i i wasn't i enjoyed his music i wasn't a big fan i've since become a fan knowing learning about him and knowing what an incredible person he was but so uh i was given free reign to roam around the property and film it and the zoo it certainly wasn't like a zoo in a city with a, a big huge place it was a kind of a confined area. It was very well kept up and buildings and outdoor areas. Um, 
And I saw the llamas and the giraffes and the large cats and elephant, but uh, it, it was called a zoo and maybe even had a sign Neverland Zoo, but uh, it wasn't a huge zoo. But, I think they, wouldn't, wouldn't they have got more of a program maybe if they featured a Californian zoo and they would have got a lot more of a story. The, the fact here is that they've gone after Michael because he's the biggest name in the world and it attracts viewers, doesn't it? It attracts attention. But there's, there's definitely zoos around the world which they could have got a better program from neglect on, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yet, yet again, pick on Michael Jackson because he's yeah. because his new because his name is so powerful and his brand. And if they could put a negative slant on this whole abuse nonsense, now it's gone from kids. Now we're talking about maybe that they're going to talk about abusing animals and neglect. I mean, so Rob, let's, why did you take part in this documentary? Let's just let's hit that on there. Let me let me add to the zoo comment. Michael's employees kept that zoo immaculate. You, it didn't smell like a zoo and animals when you went up there, and he had things for the visitors to interact with i know when, when norman took me up there at the first time there was a stairway you could climb up on the top of it and look eye to eye with jabbar if you want you know feeding yeah the giraffe if you wanted to and things like that that he had he wanted interaction and mark bencello who was one of his wonderful zookeepers there in the uh 90s uh, he raised Michael's black bear, Baloo, from a cub up to a 650-pound grown bear. And Mark would take that bear for rides in Michael's golf cart. He'd stop at the theater and go and get him a ice cream cone. So here's Blue riding around in that golf cart, his arm around Mark, eating that ice cream cone, and the guests out there watching <laughs> what's going on. And then Mark took him on the bumper cars, riding those bumper cars with Michael's music blasting away in the fog machine. And here's Blue and Mark on the bumper car ride. And Mike would see, come in and see Mark. And, Mark, would you wrestle Blue for me? Would you wrestle? And he'd kind of get him prodded in because Mark would wrestle, could wrestle Blue and have a good time and roll around. And Mark did a good, they loved it. Mark loved Blue and had a wonderful relationship with him. But Michael always liked to see Mark interact with the animals. And Michael really appreciated Mark's work uh, with the animals there. And Mark was a wonderful caretaker. And uh, I've heard a lot of wonderful things about it. But uh, uh, what, what did you want to know next here, Matt? Let, let's get on to the elephant in the room. Pardon the pun, since it's talking about a, a, a zoo documentary. But so how did they reach out to you, Rob? And how did this production company convince you this was good for Michael Jackson? What was in, your, what uh, in, August, yeah, in August of uh, last year, Harry Reid, Davies, Harry D. Davies with uh, Rare TV had contacted me and he had read my memoir, Maker of Dreams, which uh, I think everyone is familiar with, this one here, which I had, uh, because of the for good fortune of, of taking all those beautiful photographs, they became the basis of my memoir. And it's kind of funny, I was recently talking to Karen Langford at the estate, and she said, Rob, I had no idea Norma had given you permission to take your private camera there and take all these photographs. The state knew nothing about it. And uh, only because of that do we have a, a picture of what Michael created there for the children. And, uh, he, you know, he had wanted to know if I would be interested in this wonderful new documentary about Michael and the Neverland Zoo and oh, how positive it'd be. Uh, Cause that, you know, just warmed my heart cause I know how wonderful it was. And I know stories about it. And I know people that work there and I know their stories and their interaction with Michael's animals like Mark and another friend of mine had told me about how Michael would go up to the zoo at the far end of the zoo. There was a big granite boulder up there. <clears throat> and that's where Kimba was, the lion. 
and Michael felt Kemba was lonely. So he'd go up and sit on that big granite boulder. I'm getting goosebumps telling you this. And he'd sing a cappella to Kemba to keep him comfortable, comfortable. And Kemba would come up and lay next to the K, the screen. And Michael could reach through and pet Kemba. I mean, he was so bonded with these animals. It was just, it was beautiful. And I mean, if you can visualize this, Michael sitting there on this granite stove, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. And how they can take a person like that and to turn it into something ugly, it just, it it's just. Not, you, you can't upset Rob, because I mean, you've had to witness so much over your, your phone, like I have over the years, and we know the truth. But there's, it's very hard to get the truth out there because it gets twisted and people get tricked into doing these these interviews and you were clearly tricked and that it was, it very was a shame very I, very saw, I saw your comment too late unfortunately about um about this positive documentary about michael zoo and i'd already it's too late by the time I, I i i reached out to you it was it was already way away i just didn't think they had any chance of, of getting it going and it wasn't something that ross kemp would be be into and the other thing too is obviously we we've seen some information on what program may may entail which is allegations that michael um didn't m maintain the animals didn't pay them much attention and there's a bit of a publicity stunt uh but let's let's remember here michael jackson was the biggest star on earth he was in the middle of world tours he was he was writing lyrics he would tell me he would write up to 140 150 songs per album he was busy doing his dance work, taking phone calls. There was no mobile phones much back then. There was no Facebook and internet. He wasn't techie at all. Michael wasn't. He didn't even have a phone, which is a funny story, which, I, which I'll share with you about. And he would, I mean, to expect Michael to know exactly what's going on in the zoo for a start, you shouldn't make that allegation because he's dead. Only us can defend him. You, you know, you can't defame a dead person. That law needs to change, unfortunately. It is. It's terrible. And he just went there knowing and he was quite ruthless. I, I've seen him tell staff off when I've been with him, been away at, at, at um, Neverland. And if they weren't 100% right, he would fire them. Yeah, there was no messing. Michael wasn't just calm, calm, and, you know, he had his time. But when he switched, he was businessman. He wouldn't take any mess in. And as when it came to his music, his performances, you know, you'd see him on stage and he would, he would fire off at the... The um, band, if they didn't get the music perfectly right, you see him in This Is It, where he's correcting, we've got to rehearse, we've got to get it right. He was all about perfection. And those animals were, if he got wind, the animals weren't being treated right in any way, he'd be all over it. You know, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. People would no. get fired for, for, for anything at the Neverland that wasn't yeah. perfection. He was all about being perfection. He was, he was about perfection. That's one thing about Michael and I were both perfectionists. And... It, it, you know, that helped us get along with what we did there. And uh, whew, uh, that's that's you know, I, thought, I thought I could help Harry find the right people to get the right information, to get the truth. And that's why I took you to the people I did. And I know Mark Biancello was with me when they interviewed me. I was holding up my memoir. Mark was on this side, and we were opening up and thumbing through the pages. And Ross Kemp was the interviewer, for whatever that's worth. Turned out to so be the. I think explain Ross Kemp is for the people who are listening worldwide. He's a very respected. He was a big soap opera star. Not, not he by played, me. He's yeah, the, he, the most, the worst interview of my entire life. I had made up some talking points for, for him because he knew nothing about me or my relationship with Michael. So I just made up a little short list of some talking points so he would know some ideas or things he could ask me about during the interview so I could expand on them for him. He wanted nothing to do with it. He wouldn't even look at it. Oh, we don't need that. Just whatever comes to mind. So the only thing I had left to do was just hold up my me memoir and 
flip through the pages and talk about some of the pictures and, and things like that. <clears throat> and he only asked me three questions. It was the same damn question every time. Do you know where any of Michael's animals are? He'd cut into whatever I'm saying. Well, do you know where any of Michael's animals are? He was rude. He was arrogant. He's a freaking idiot. And I have no respect for that person. He didn't give a damn about Michael Jackson. He didn't give a damn about how those animals were taken care of in the right way. He only wanted to get to the bottom of trying to find out all the negative stuff. I know Mark, Mark made a comment to me. He said, this was a setup from the start. And Mark. Mark, Mark, by the way, is the, the Mark the, Biancello was the zookeeper there for Michael, the one that raised Baloo for him and, and uh, other animals. He, you know, he had a, he he just was a, he's a wonderful zookeeper. He had TV programs out of Santa Barbara and I think Santa Maria and stuff. And he's on locally there and very uh, very loyal to Michael and trusted by Michael. Oh he? my God, yes, yes, and. Uh, he, that's, that's all, but as soon as but Mark and I were talking, that's the first thing he said to me. He said, this was a setup from the start. Mark saw it. I realized it. I mean, I, I tried to contact Harry at least three times to talk to him about it. He wouldn't talk to me. He's the producer of the program. Yeah, Harry Davies. Harry Davies, yeah. He was. He said, "I'm already on some else other project. Here, go try to get a hold of Johnny." I sent them emails. They wouldn't get back to me. They had nothing to talk to me about it. For them, I was over with. I was history. I had nothing to. I wanted to pull my part out, get out of the damn thing. I was so upset by that time. I wanted nothing more to do with them. It was a joke. And I knew it by then, but it was it was too late. They'd gotten me in it. I'd gotten trapped. That documented me on film. I was very emotional the day I was out across the road from the Neverland Gates and they were filming me and I was going through my book and these memories were coming back. It was very difficult. I remember Harry saying, well, you're awfully emotional, aren't you? Well, yeah, I, kind of, yeah, I didn't say that, but yeah, it was very difficult for me to talk about some of the things there that day and uh, to share them with them. They told me, um, Rob, that they were pretty sure, they were 100% sure that, that they were going to get access to the film at the ranch. And obviously, I, I know of the new owner. And after that last documentary, Leaving Neverland, I thought there's just no way there could be any truth to that. Was there any truth to that, Rob? Well, I had contact with Ron Burkle and his son, John. Ron Burkle was a new owner of Neverland. Yeah, and I made the, I made the attempt for him. And they didn't want to film the pet, the zoo areas. <clears throat> they hadn't had a chance to clean it up or do any work up there. They were working in other parts of the ranch, and I could understand. It, you know, it was it was a mess. So they didn't want any filming done up there. And uh, while we're on this subject, uh, the Burkles sent me a letter from their attorney specifically stating no flyovers of the ranch. I forwarded this to Harry Davies. What did they do? Totally ignored it. They got to California, went to Santa Barbara Airport, charged with the Cessna 182 or something. Boom, up in the air. That's, they took Mark, flew him over the ranch, did their filming. I was at the, at the airport when they brought him back and landed. Johnny, I think Johnny McDermott, Mark, Harry Davies, and the pilot, I believe, were the ones in the plane. They didn't care what the attorney said. They totally ignored Ron Burkle's request and respect their privacy. That's the arrogance these bastards had. They, they, they're just going to do it their way and to hell with it. Um, it upset me. 
I was, I was. They tried it on with you to, to do whatever they can to get in the gates of Everland. That was their, yeah, their hope, I guess, was to win you round, yeah, and gain access to film it there. That, that's what baffled me. How the heck did they film this without being in the ranch? What's the story? Where's the angle? There's nothing to film. Yeah, you know, the animals are not there anymore. A lot of them would have passed away. A lot of them would have got old. Jabbar, the the giraffe. Michael used to tell me he used to be at Havenhurst, the the other house in the Mendocino, and. So he, he must, that giraffe must be getting old. And they're, I think they're going to claim that something awful happens to him in a way. Well, um, I was suspicious I when they decided to ignore the attorney. I became suspicious when Ross Kemp didn't even want to look at my talking points. I became very suspicious when Ross only had that one question. Do you know where any Michael's animals are? Do you know where any Michael's animals are? Do you know where any Michael's animal were? Three times, the same damn question. <clears throat> and uh, and then Mark confirmed it. Rob, this is a setup from the start. And uh, what we, made Mark believe that? Well, their actions, their attitudes, the way they were talking, dealing with us. Uh, he just picked up on the vibes the same I did. They were they were just so singularly minded. And then Mark arranged for them to go to Oregon to see his friend uh, Hayden Rosenauer, I believe it is. He took that, so many animals in, right? That, huh? He took so many animals in. For Michael. Yeah, no, he had uh, Baba, the elephant up there. He was, was taking care of, he had a, like a 700 acre nature preserve up there. And he's very much a recluse, much like Michael, and didn't want people in there. He'd have problems with PETA, kind of like Michael. And But they agreed to uh, donate $10,000 to a charity he has to help animals in order to get permission to go up and film him. I talked to Harry. I said, Harry, you should take Mark up there and let him go up with you to be with Hayden, because Mark knows Hayden very well, to help him with the interview. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. And Mark told me afterwards the hate that it was a fiasco. It was a disaster when they went up there to film Hayden. Uh, was, was the vibe in the questions aimed at neglect, abuse then? That, they, yes. Is that when you went for it? And they got off on the bull hook. Was it anchor or whatever it is? Uh, Hayden had one there on his ranch and they saw it and that triggered them. And Hayden said, I haven't used one of those for years. He, he said, you know, when we, I first got into the business and training, I said that was something that was commonly used. But he said, no, I haven't touched one of those for years. Don't use them. Don't believe in them. But he happened to still have one there. But they got off on that. We're grilling him about the use of that thing. Just things like they, anything they could find a negative in, they targeted it. And just drove Hayden crazy. Just oh. I think the biggest focus is going to be on the, the biggest star of the zoo, which is Bubbles the Chimp, which you and I both know a long, 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 long time ago. So everyone, everyone who's friends with Michael, I always ask him, where's Bubbles? What happened to Bubbles? You know, it's fascinating. And he told me Bubbles got to the stage when chimpanzees, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and they get aggressive. That's right. And he had to be managed properly That's and right. go to the right place and he had right. someone, someone caring for him full time and he would even attack Michael at the stage because that's just the way he is he could do some serious damage yes, he, so he was moved to I believe was he moved to Florida Miami Florida yes a sanctuary down there for great apes yes and Michael funded funded and looked the after family still funds every year the care of bubbles in that sanctuary down there yes they still yeah. provide for his care and through the estate or through the family, I'm not sure, but they're they're involved in Bubbles' care. Make sure that was the arrangement when they accepted Bubbles that they would support take care for his care. In fact, they have made additional donations to the sanctuary to improve and and expand the the great ape exhibit, the chimpanzee area, to make it better and more comfortable. And Bubbles has developed close relationships with other chimpanzees, friendships, 
Uh, they have had nothing but wonderful reports on Bubbles down there and how he's getting along. It's been all positive. Uh, no matter what you hear, whatever you read, it's all false. All you got to do is get hold of I think it's Patty Reagan, <clears throat> the founder, director down there at the sanctuary. They, they made a documentary which the Toya, Michael's sister, starred in, and she went to visit Bubbles. It got very emotional, but she was very impressed, it seemed, by the way he was treated yes. and looked after and so on. And, and for anyone to think that Michael wouldn't have visited, of course he would have done. It's in his private life, but wherever he goes is always a big fuss. You saw what it was like, Rob. It was manic. But he would have, he would have kept check on 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 everything that goes on behind the scenes. And um, can we talk about the other apes? So about the chimpanzees, because I've I've been there, and actually one of them tried to bite me. If I'm honest, I wasn't too <laughs> impressed. But um, yeah, they have free reign; they could do what they want. But I was there. But so the uh, what's your information on well, the? Well, I had Michael had a couple of baby orangutans <clears throat> when I was there in. Uh, 93 april may may of 93 i think it was michael had called me on a monday morning said rob i need a ride in here this saturday and we had a brand new wipeout coming off the production line that wednesday and i want to know if i could get it in there delivered and installed by that saturday he had some party or big event going on so he bought it and we moved, delivered it Saturday morning at 7 a.m. And by one o'clock that day, Michael and I were riding it, <laughs> dog radio. And I have a photograph that one of the, somebody, Michael had called out there and I guess they had these baby orangutans in the house and they were being taken cared for and asked them to bring them down to me. And there was a, and the girl that was taking care of them and we're out there holding them in front of the wipeout. Uh, just real tiny little things. I don't know what became of them. Uh, but Michael enjoyed sharing the animals, interaction with the guests and the people. So he he wanted me to have that experience with those baby orangutans, which was really precious. I think one of them was a chimp and one of them was orangutans, I remember. I think I was there, he had two chimps. Two different. Larry, did you see, what did you see when you were there animal-wise? And was everything in... I mean, let's bear in mind, this is 2005, probably the, the worst time in Michael Jackson's, well, I know it was the worst time, life ever, traumatic. Not only with the, the allegations that were made against him, which he had to cope for, cope with, and get up very early from Neverland to go to the court each day. You know, he had, he had to wake up at like 3.30 in the morning to get ready. And things, I think it's well publicized now, things weren't going well financially. I don't want to dodge that. I mean, there were some mistakes made. Uh, which would be fixed in the background. I won't go into too much detail on that because a lot of that's private information, but nothing that would affect the zoo. I, there, was, there, was, there was somebody placed in charge um, of, of uh, the, the management. Obviously, Michael had to think about his album, his promotions, his next step in his career. So he took on, in my time, there was probably six or seven managers. The last one I knew of, who was at IC, was at the hospital when he died, was Dr. We used to be known as Dr. Tume Tume. And uh, oh, Robert, God. Hold your fire on that one, Rob. I know you got to say about that guy. But um, he took his responsibility, from what I understand. He managed Neverland. He had to look for a way out of the financial situation for Michael. He was very well connected. Um, maybe that's another reason why he, he was looking through these 50 shows. He kind of gelled that all together for Michael. Michael was the creator, the performer, not the person to manage things and, and so on. So, Larry, you went there, very open mind. Very right. privileged to have have full access and to film everything for a very good reason for it to be scrutinized by the court. I'd imagine they were looking for fault. Did they find any fault? Did you see that? You, you said he's like a real good guy, Larry. And uh, I imagine if you saw any concern, you'd be straight on the phone, right, to the authorities in the way this documentary could be pr pushing things forward or, or getting the public to believe. What was your impression? And what did you yeah, see? Yeah. Out of well, I'm really surprised that uh, I was surprised to learn that the documentary, this new documentary, is, paints a negative view of the animals because all I saw were they were groomed all, uh, very nicely, their conditions were great. And I saw the llamas, the parrots, the the lions, the giraffes, the elephant. Um, 
all types of animals that just seem to be taking, I'm, I'm certainly no veterinarian or anything, but uh, uh, it, it really stood out how this, this is even more pristine than a real zoo. That, you know, they just were taken care of wonderfully. So I certainly didn't see any way in which they were mistreated. Larry, do you remember any odors when you were there? No, now that you mention it, I, I don't know. <laughs> there are any Most zoos have that common smell of animals and fecal material. So every zoo I've been into, never, 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 yeah. never, never. I get you. Yeah. But <laughs> let me make a comment about bubbles. <clears throat> I did hear a comment made by these guys about bubbles in his background and where he came from, that he had been, uh, as a baby, taken from his mother or something, I don't remember, through tra uh, traffickers, or I don't remember the whole exact story, how it was. And they were looking at, at it as a negative light, of course. Well, I'm looking at it in the positive light then here comes Michael Jackson along and rescues this poor baby. He was a little tiny baby chimpanzee. You know, I have had animals that I've raised, like baby raccoons when their eyes were closed, that, you know, I've raised them and, and you know, they just, they bond to you. Somebody had rescued Bubbles and Michael came along and took him in to his care and raised him as his own baby. And they're trying to make something bad out of that. How do you make, just because somebody else had taken him away from his mother or some bad back, background, that had nothing to do with Michael. Michael didn't instruct anybody to go out there in the jungle and capture this baby chimp and, and take him away. But somebody yeah. rescued him and Michael rescued the chimp. And that's what the beauty of it is and gave him a beautiful home. And now he's in Florida in this wonderful sanctuary. What would have happened to that chimp if Michael hadn't come along? He'd have probably ended up in some laboratory as an experiment. And I know he's done that with the majority of the animals there, Robert. The tigers, I know he did. They were spotted in New York and being mistreated, and he rescued yeah. them. Yes. And, and people would write to him and, and tell him about things, you know, and he would, he yes. would intercept. Exactly. Uh, just in a way. He heard about out. animal abuse. Man, he was all over it. I know, I got to yeah. tell you, you've probably heard this story. Maybe you were there. South Africa, Johannesburg. He was having a concert there. He was on stage. Mike Wayne was his bodyguard there at the time. A grasshopper got on the stage. Michael stopped yeah. the show and had Wayne come out and remove this grasshopper. Please don't kill it. Please don't kill it. And made him save this grasshopper. That's Michael Jackson. He wanted to make sure it didn't get hurt right in the middle of his concert. He didn't want a moonwalk, moonwalk over a bug. Huh? He didn't want a moonwalk over a bug yeah. in the middle of his show. Yeah. I think that used to happen quite often. At, uh, Wayne Nagan, right? He used to yes. be pulled up in the, in the history tour, I think that was. Yeah. But yeah, I, I know. And it, it, you know, let's be honest here. Let's, let's look at what appears to be the case. The documentary has been very successful so far. We've been making allegations that are false against Michael about unproven child abuse. That's finished and done with now. No one seems to want to go there anymore after the disastrous Leaving Neverland documentary. Is this another attempt to find Michael as a bad person? Yet again, this time on animals. Yet when you bear in mind the staff there, you talk about Mark, but I understand he had specialists come in and look after the different types of creatures there and made sure that they were they, there was it was nothing to do with michael their main maintenance he funded it but you had a lot of people were involved in that care the staff at neverland was phenomenal it, it was the cost of running it it wasn't just michael mucking out the uh the gorilla pens and and the lions or nothing like that he just went in there but he had specialist staff role and that was that was very obvious to anyone who went there I don't know who this person is. He posted this on MJ Vibe <clears throat> on March 27th when this documentary was released. His name is Mark, M-A-R-C. 
but he was involved in the transportation of some of these animals, the relocation. Comment, more bullshit for sure. Even the commercial for the documentary states after Michael Jackson's death, those animals were removed over two years before his death, known as was the one that removed the moved. I was the one that removed a lot of them. Also wasted a lot of time with Harry in pre-production of the documentary. They used a lot of people and then turned it into something full of lies and bullshit. None of it is fact, it's all fiction. Just another example of bad TV. I think that says it perfectly clear <coughs> about this upcoming documentary. That's just another example of <coughs> bad journalism. And, and, you know, these guys get them, they, th they think they can get away with this. So, Rob, who's, who, who's obviously we've got Larry here. Who else did you get involved? Who we can, I know there's a lot of upset and, and worry about these documentaries and everything from your friends from the ranch. Yeah. So, who else is involved and what's their general opinion? Are they all devastated as well? Well, Matt, uh, and I, I can speak for myself. Self, you know, Rob, yeah, well, and Rob turned uh, them on to me, and uh, I had no idea that it was going to be anything negative. And um, I. yeah, so they used some of my footage. Uh, certainly, thought nothing was wrong with the with using the footage if it just shows how well they were treated. Um, and and then I heard through the grapevine that uh, well, first Rob let me know it looked like it has turned out into a negative documentary and then I heard from fans and I, I felt terrible because you know Michael just treated uh, the animals so well and, and one point I wanted to make is a lot of people say wasn't Michael odd for having animals and kids around him what about being oh. a regular adult and I'd say well the animals didn't judge him and then the kids tended not to judge him um, he, he is so understandable that he would feel comfortable around them and, and use them for creative purposes for the lyrical music and dance he did. So I feel, I feel really bad about how this documentary has turned out. So how would you think they would take your footage and put a negative slam on anything to do with Michael Jackson's zoo at Neverland? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm curious. They, I'm sure you're curious. So what? I, I, I guess they... <laughs> I guess what they'll do is they'll they'll show the animals my if they use my footage, show how they were well treated, but say but behind the scenes they were treated awfully or something like that. I don't know how they're going to twist it, and maybe they'll add filters to it. Maybe they'll even manipulate the footage. I don't know, uh, but I'm I feel terrible about them doing it that way. So oh, Rob, yes sir, what's your message to the fans and the media then? Because I know you'll get. You're going to get a bit of, um, as we say in English, stick over this because you try to help out your friend. Yes. And it's I thought I was doing the right thing, but you know what? <clears throat> I'm glad I did it because we're bringing these people out and exposing them for the, who they really are. They're beasts. And uh, I feel good about it that we've ex we're exposing them. And uh, we're doing it in time before they can get their bullshit out to the public. And uh, I don't regret it. We've, I've learned a lot. Uh, I just regret they had a wonderful opportunity and turned it into something filthy and dirty and bad and negative to try to tarnish Michael's legacy. Who, who else did you reach out to to oh, help? Well, Alan, Alan Scanlon. He was interviewed. You know, big Al for the train station. Big, right? big Al, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know about Mark and Mark Biancello and, and uh, uh, Hayden Rosen Rosenauer. Um, oh boy. Uh, I think you've got the same impression as you. Then it's just going to be a disaster. Yeah. They yeah. have. Yeah. Do they hold anything a grudge against you? Or bad thoughts for yeah. introducing. I hope not. I, mean, I didn't start this to cause a negative documentary. I started out with full intentions of doing what Harry and I talked about. But this is a once in a lifetime opportunity 
to do a documentary about Michael and his zoo, something that has never been documented before. And so we have a wonderful opportunity here, Harry. Let's not let's not abuse it and let's do it right. I think from, from early conversations, you were told you would get privy rights to, to watch the program before that you, um, you, I think you got text messages between you and Harry, because I'm sure you sent them to me about it's, it's nonsense, it's going to be a positive documentary. Right. I mean, you were just convinced, weren't you? And that, for them to put that in writing is a bit silly, really, because if that gets in Michael Jackson's estate's hands now, it makes you wonder what the Michael Jackson estate will do, because they, they're not going to take this very lightly. And you've got written evidence from a producer of this program, and so have I, by the way, I'm on my phone, I got the text, I made sure I saved them. I actually felt like t texting Harry the other day and said, saying, told you so, I knew I couldn't trust you and you were full of, you know, and, but I, I didn't give him that satisfaction. So the best way he can learn about things and how the, the, let him let him experience some of the Michael Jackson fans and how they're going to feel around the public and yeah. on the manipulation of his friends and his network. Now let's go back to Ross Kemp because for the people who don't know who Ross Kemp, I know you're very emotional. Just calm down for a second for him a minute. <laughs> Ross Kemp, so Ross Kemp in England is a big name. Um, he made his name all, as an actor on a big soap, one of the biggest soaps called EastEnders. It was a playing a character called Graham Mitchell. Then he became a BAFTA award-winning documentary maker. Now I have to say, I watched a lot of his documentaries and up to now, can't put a fault. Unbelievable. Now, do you really, really believe? Is he just presenting this, or did he know the narrative? Or do you think he's got words put in his mouth by producers and powers at ITV? I think he knew he exactly what he was doing. Right, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he uh, he was too adamant about his procedure. He didn't, he didn't know jack crap about Michael. He didn't want to know about Michael. He uh, only wanted to know any... any anything about the animals and where they were so they could find go out and dig out the the dirt and without larry's footage it makes you wonder what the hell would they be talking about they got nothing to show they got people who said that positive things about i expect they're trying to put words in people's mouths so i imagine they try to do that with you because that's normally how it works with presenters i've not seen ross kemp work i've never met ross but it just doesn't sound like ross kemp i think when people hear about this they'll think It'll add credibility to it, having Ross Kemp attached to this documentary, because he is seen as a very trustworthy, outspoken. He goes into like Johannesburg, where all the rough areas are. He talks out against rapists out there. He's seen as a good guy. So this would be quite shock shocking to the public to see that he's been in some involved, maybe or not, maybe, who knows, in some kind of manipulation of Michael Jackson's network of friends and staff and uh in order to get a program made. Well, I don't, think, I don't think he has any journalistic integrity, any of these guys. I think they're just a bunch of jokers. Michael used to play a negative news south. That's it. And that's why he oh. never wanted to give interviews. And yeah, the, I, truth I does, the truth doesn't sell. That's the sad part about it. And he was very, I mean, he, you know yourself, Oprah Winfrey and him were, were knew each other. He did a 93 live documentary I think it was 93, around then, from um, from Neverland Valley. He had a lot of trust in her. And I know from my own knowledge, this is, this is a fact, that Oprah Winfrey was a frequent visitor and, and Mrs. Jackson, Catherine Jackson, Mike, Michael's mother, used to let, let Oprah into Havenhurst, the family home, which Michael bought for the family and I believe still in the, the estate till today. Yes, it is. And then she turned on Michael. Now... Is that for viewers or because he's not, he's dead and he's not here? He would be horrified, Rob. He would be horrified that Oprah Winfrey turned, turned on him after all that praise she gave him when he was alive, you know? No. It just seems that negative new cells, and if you can't defame a dead person, they can say what they want about anyone or you and I when we're gone. No, no one could do anything about it. I mean, the law right. needs to change there. And this council con culture is that negative new cells, anything positive. No one wants to watch it. They want to glue on to Netflix and if it's negative, they're oh look what he's doing, you know, and, yeah. and so on. But yeah, it's kind of shocking for me because Ross Kemp doesn't come across. I think the, the people of the UK especially will be absolutely amazed to hear what's 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 happened here from you. I mean, you've been so open about everything, and 
you don't normally speak out. My, my, all Michael's friends, we, you know, you, you, you're damned if you do or don't, but you're so passionate about this that you want to get the truth out. Because you've had enough, I guess. You've had enough of watching your friend being battered and beaten, alive and dead. You can't I've had it. enough of their comments they're putting out about this upcoming documentary and the crap and the lies that they're telling about it. It's ridiculous. They're building up all these falsehoods trying to, to help sell it. And they have sold it all over the world. Ugh, all about money. That's all it is. They only care about the money. They don't care who they hurt, who they step on, what they have to tell to get the, get it sold. Just make it spectacular. Tell the lies, you know. Lies sell. The truth, like you said, truth ain't going to sell. The, the, the thing is, mainstream media, as we all know, is dying. What well, used to get 25, 20 million viewers on a Saturday night, some shows in England, they're lucky to get one or two million now. And the, the only way you're going to get exposure is by having negative news. It's dying. Social media is taking over. Netflix, on demand, whenever you want. Yeah. And it, there's a saying I learned from a friend of mine, um, Rob Moore, which is fear screams louder when it's dying, they say. Mainstream's dying. People, presenters, maybe production companies are worried that, that, that they won't be in ITV in the future. They won't be right. just trying. We started off when I was growing up, there was just three channels. Then there was five. Now there's like thousands. Then you've got Netflix. So people get worried and, and go to extreme lengths when they feel they're going to lose their career <clears throat> and they need to start going a bit more um, controversial is probably the word, which Michael was a master at. I must admit that. A lot of the things that Michael did in his life, he designed, you know this, Rob, the, the white glove, the, the trousers that went along after loafers, which I know he gave you some, a pair of those, the fedora, you know, the, the high-pitched voice, we didn't speak like that in real life. We know exactly how he, his normal, deep voice. And when he got mad, he got mad. Uh, he, he created this whole image, which has backfired on him in death, which is hard for him to, to recur. I know Taj Jackson, his nephew, who's a wonderful guy, is putting together a documentary to absolutely kill everything, all the myths, and show all the motives behind these, these, these documentaries. But, yeah, this is a rather bizarre one, and I hope it isn't going to be as bad as what we think. I've spent a lot of time with Taj, um, Bob, and actually I was, I, I had a similar problem. I had a, uh, I did a program with the Jackson family and we were made promises and so on. And uh, it went terribly wrong. I watched the program at the end, mainstream TV, it was another channel, it wasn't ITV. And obviously we've come to, I can't go to the details of the settlement, but obviously clearly part of the settlement was that that program can never be played again or sold internationally. It was shown once, so clearly everything went in my favour. Uh, I was watching the program back thinking, what in the heck is that? And Taj lived with, with me pretty much for, I would say, a good a month or six weeks. Lovely guy. But I think he just gets bombarded with this all the time about his uncle. And he's trying to put together this program. Then COVID hits, you know, which makes it hard for him to go. Then I think he had another baby too. I know he I know he means the best, and I think if he he gets so many messages per day, I think if he knew your intentions and so on and and the value you could you could add, because he he's a few years older than me, so he would have been a young lad when you were creating this with with with, with Michael Jackson. So he's probably not aware, but maybe hopefully he'll listen to this and he'll become aware and he'll reach out to you because I think you'll be a tremendous asset to it. And also with, with the Jackson family, I noticed too, whenever people like, like I told you about this Ross Kemp situation, he's presenting an award show next month, which I'm attending, and apparently I'm getting a, an award at. If I'm seen with Ross Kemp now after this program, the Jackson family and the fans will think, well, Matt Finesse, he must have been paid a lot of money to be part, to, 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 to be, maybe he's funding this documentary, maybe he's behind it, you know? I rejected being part of this documentary because of this, this concern that became true. So from Taj's point of view, he might see your book there. And I know what goes through the family's mind. They've been screwed over all over and over again. They think Rob is making millions off a book deal there, off my uncle. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and, and the bad thing is you probably self-published that or got paid peanuts for it just to keep your friend's legacy out there, his creativeness, I'd imagine. Let me insert something here. This memoir has helped me build schools, two of them so far in Africa, one in Ghana 
and the last one in Malawi. I've donated tens of thousands of dollars. I built a kindergarten in uh, the Michael Jackson Memorial Kindergarten in Ghana. And if we finished it in 2018, I believe, August 2018. And then uh, Michael Jackson's legacy, building a school for special needs children in Malawi. They desperately are in need of these special needs facilities. I've donated, I'm sure, way over half the funds that they needed to build this school, which just opened this January. I can't remember how many children they have already enrolled in it. Uh, and they're both at Africa. And it, you know, it does my heart good. I, I pledged, I don't remember how many copies of my memoir, 100% of the proceeds that soul went to help build that school. I don't make money off this memoir. You see my t-shirt? Pay, yeah, yeah, yeah. pay Michael forward with Maker of Dreams. I use that memoir to donate funds to pay Michael forward. I don't make money off that memoir. There's no money in books unless you're JK Rowling's, and even that's probably different now as well, or, or, or somebody like that, that's, that's gone. Those days are long gone. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I think with the, the Jackson family, they've just gone through so much. And uh, they just, when is this ever going to stop? I mean, now this is a ridiculous documentary, in my view, personally. A stupid subject. They, they, they interviewed his zookeeper. You couldn't get any closer to the animals than Mark. And he must be distraught and devastated by, by it because he's done so much hard work for those animals at Neverland. And now he's going to be made out to be insisting, insisting in abuse and neglect. I was, Mark, I was so, or mad, I'm sorry. I was so blessed to have been there in Michael's life when I was. These are some of the happiest years in Michael's life. And I saw him having so much fun there, enjoying life, enjoying the children. Living his dream, his lifelong dream was to build this amusement park for the children of the world. And it just makes me so happy and feel so blessed that I got to be part of those years with Michael. It just, oh, you don't know how special that is with me. I could never, ever make money off my friend ever do that to my I, I didn't write this book for profit i paid for it a hundred percent out of my pocket and i've never made a dime off of it never will never intended to it's all to pay michael forward to give him something that he couldn't see while he was here so in on his behalf as my, as the neverland valley historian and his maker of dreams for the rest of my life, I will continue to pay Michael forward. Yeah, so I, I, I'm totally in line with you with that one. Uh, I've never earned a penny off Michael Jackson, although I've been accused of many times because every time you see him on TV, people say you're getting paid. Or oh, if yeah. you say if you say gross about him, it gets uh, twisted. I give you a good example. I had um, a a big newspaper in the UK, and they were going to report positively on the Leaving Neverland documentary with, on the back of Martin Bashir, that, that Diana's documentary, he's been found guilty for manipulating that. And oh this, this, this type of, he's found guilty of doing that. So they, they looked at the Michael Jackson one thinking, could he have manipulated Michael Jackson? So well, I know he did, because I was there. Well, at the initial meeting. So, and they knew I was at the meeting. So they called me up and they said, um, would you mind giving us a quote? Because they need to hang it on somebody who knew Michael in the UK about the Bashir documentary. I was at the initial meeting and they said to me, do you think Michael Jackson's estate would sue, would sue uh, Martin Bashir if um, it was found that Martin was, you know, mis 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 around with the footage, manipulated Michael? And I said, yes, Michael Jackson's estate, meaning Prince Paris Blanket, John Branca, the executor, I think they would sue, and they should do, and I think they would. They've had enough now. 
Now, when that went to print, it said, it said uh, Michael Jackson's former bodyguard, Matt Fidesz, says Michael Jackson's family, not estate, family, will sue if, if uh, Bashir is found to be guilty of, of um, messing around with the, with the footage of that. Now, I upset Taj Jackson on that. Taj Jackson went on the pod podcast, so I was acting like, a, he didn't say my name. I oh, know, I think he was aimed at me anyway, that I was, um, I was trying to be a family spokesman. No, I was, trying, I was told if I give them a line, it would be front page of the paper rather than a little small column. And it was front page, and it made big news, and it was positive. It showed that it was going to manipulate it. And this is the problem. I know Taj was a little bit upset with me, I think, because he felt I shouldn't have spoke out. But had I not have spoke out, it would have been a tiny little feature. You damned all you do, don't with Michael Jackson. You just can't win. They just take things and they twist it. And like the whole Jacko thing, I'm told the reason they call him that because it fits nicely on the front page. And they, that's the issue. Oh, God. That's but stupid. This is why I think some of his, some people say, why don't his friends and family speak out more? You just can't win, Rob. Yeah. This is a, on a podcast like this, we can say what we want and we can talk openly. But when we got to rely on a reporter to then twist what we say in the right way, we said it in the right meaning, in the right words. And I think the Jacksons, they look on at things and people like you, me, or other people are part of the legacy. Um, and I've got no problem with the Jackson family. They're wonderful people. But what go, they, they, sometimes they got to understand is that the way Michael was treated and manipulated by the media... Mm-hmm. His Ooh. friends and his family have been just the same. And we get pulled into the drama just because we're part of his life, just like you've been pulled in. You're a massive part of his life. I mean, I was nothing compared to you um, and the closeness you had there. And this, uh, he was a shy guy. I mean, he was very, shy. very shy. Very shy. When you told me on about a uh, call cool once about uh, when he saw the rides being built, and even then, you know, his own home, he would be protected. Yeah, I told you, he was sitting out there in his SU- that black SUV. And- Watch people. Um, just three more questions before we finish, Rob. I'm, I'm gonna have okay. to ask, I'm gonna have to ask you probably the most common one you've been asked and I've been asked, and it and which is to me ridiculous because I run an organization of martial arts and dance schools of 150,000 kids training per week. I wouldn't associate myself with uh, a, a nasty man, anyone who I think abused children or animals or anything. I, I had that closeness to him where he mixed with my own children and my stepchildren who were. Two boys at the time, seven and five, and he used to take them out of Hamley shopping and no issues at all. They're all grown up now in their late 20s, and uh, I would not associate myself to anyone like that. I stuck out. I wouldn't be here today linking myself to him. Now, you're at the ranch more than I was. You built that, that damn thing with him to his dream, made his dream come true. And in that t- time frame, and we can't dodge this question because I don't want to think people we think that we contrived this interview – and they want me to ask you it, and I'm sure you've been asked it before. In that time frame, is a time frame where, so say, all these allegations were made, abuse, and so on. Did you see anything at all, whatsoever, on that ranch that made you think, hmm, maybe there's something not quite right here with, with uh, Michael Jackson? And um, is there anything you could tell that would combat that, that whole narrative? And why do you think Neverland, quite three questions, why do you think Neverland is pulled into? Becoming such a drama lately. What, what's what's what, what's doing it? What's the fascination? And Michael Jackson, because he was he was a secretive person to those of us who knew him. He was very private, as you know, and I know. And there's a lot that people don't know about Michael Jackson, like his giving tree there at the ranch where he spent a lot of time. He would crawl up that tree and he had a platform built up there where he could sit up there and read and write his songs and poems and be all alone. So he could spend a day up there all by himself and nobody could bother him. He, he lived in his own world. He would appreciate the, the simple things, wouldn't he? Because he had everything out. So go back to the giving tree. People might find that strange he was sitting on the tree, but he kind of sit in a park or on a beach like everyone else can and read books. That's, and also, I, I've been at Neverland, and um, I've seen staff members where they, they do get fascinated by him, and they stare at him, and they, they, they try and start a conversation. He doesn't really have peace there when he's walking around, Rob, does he? And there is security everywhere he goes, and it's it's... As normal as you can get for Mike, I guess. But it was, uh, but it was not normal. But it, the, the whole thing with the 
the allegations, I think, is the bigger the star, the bigger the target. And like you said, he's the superstar of superstars. I've been to weddings before. I've been to one particular wedding where Michael was best man. And the wedding was full of major celebrities, ma massive names. And uh, at the end of it, everyone, all the big names, go for Michael to have a picture of an autograph. He's like the star of the stars. So it, it was, you know, an unfortunate issue. And it's sad that we have to still go through this 12 years after he's passed away. And I, I hope things will improve and that people remember him for his dance and his legacy. And also, did you know, you probably do, he's the biggest donator to the charity of all time. But no one wants to print that. No one wants to print that. And I don't want to get, you know, it's quite That's why I'm trying to carry on his legacy and do things over in Africa and his name for children, things like that. All the time, and also, he, you know, he had his female friend. No one wants to talk about that, Rob, but you were privy to that more than I was. And, um, you know, it's just ridiculous being into kids and then, you know, all this type of now animals abuse. And he had girlfriends. Oh. You, you and I both know who they are. We won't name them and they've got a permission, but but um, I know you've had contact with, with with one of them recently, but yeah, he was a normal guy who created the mystery. He used to say to us, Rob, when we were on the road, Matt, remember, I, I want my life to be the greatest show on earth. I want it to be the mystery. I don't want people to, I don't want to upset my gay fans, my straight fans. I don't want people to know if I've got a girlfriend. I want to keep people guessing. And right. he came out one day, I, and this would really, um, I, I was in my 20s. I didn't want to ask him why he put tape over his fingers and stuff like that. But one day, he, out, he took ages to get ready, Rob. We were late. I was a bit annoyed with him. And he came out and had all this sticky tape on his nose. And we we're going to a business meeting. There's going to be a lot of media there. And he saw that I was a bit concerned about it. And he goes, Matt, this is just allergy tape. I put this on my nose because it guarantees me the fuzzle duzzle. I said, what do you mean fuzzle duzzle? He said, all the media attention the next day. This will give me millions of pounds of publicity I cannot buy. Nothing's wrong with my nose. It's not falling off, but let's make them believe that, okay? It's just <laughs> allergy tape. And we went out and he looked utterly ridiculous, but he was right. A couple of days later, every page all over the world. And he couldn't, money couldn't do it. Let's come back to the documentary then. So, okay, you never saw anything inappropriate of any children on the ranch at all, whatsoever. Nothing with the animals. I mean, that's just your view, utterly ridiculous. Never. And um, yeah, if you could talk to Ross Kemp right now and 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 Rare TV or whatever the production or Harry or or, or could you, maybe ITV don't know because they're just the people are funded. If you could talk to Rare TV right now, what would your message be about Michael Jackson Zoo? the documentary coming up by Ross Kemp and Red There was absolutely nothing wrong with Michael Jackson's animals in the zoo. And if they have anything they want to try to infer to that effect, they should pull the documentary. I it's, think they should it's, 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 all, it's totally a blatant lie. Totally. And, and you'll go as far as to say that to them if you're in court. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No doubt about it. I, I knew zookeepers and animal care keepers, and I was out there with the animals and a ranch manager, and they they wouldn't let anything happen. They they knew Michael owned these animals. They took yeah. care of them like they were their own pets. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let anything happen to them. It's it's a very sad end to what was an incredible legacy, and that man impacted my life. He taught me how to franchise my business and. I went on to make millions of my own right, my own businesses and things, and to dream big that you nothing's impossible. There's such no such word as can. He was just such an influential figure, and a lot of, a lot of positives can be learned about Michael Jackson. Oh, and unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately um, I'm hoping things like free speech, like the only thing we've got at the moment is podcasts, everything else, like your Facebook post got cancelled. I know friends have lost their accounts because they mentioned COVID on it or they mentioned the ukraine wow. war and their, their accounts are just disabled and it's a shame and with, with michael it, people do need to speak out Carl jackson is a good guy and i hope he does get this documentary made it's, it's challenging i think because he's making that from what i believe a, a lot of um, a documentary series but then he's got to get the right platform and obviously he wants netflix maybe or something like that well, i don't gonna, know what taja's mission is on his documentary but to leave out michael jackson's neverland dream is to leave out the happiest years of michael's life and i don't see i, I will email this to taj uh, i'm sure he'll reach out 
let's hope that this doesn't have any effect on your relationship with your friends that took part in, on this documentary and and Ross Kemp and everyone else knows what they've got themselves into and uh, and well, I think for you, you just want the fans, the fans and the public to know the truth, don't you? That's, that's all it comes down to. That's, that's all we and want. Jack, all Jack. we want is the truth. I saw a picture of you, which was taken fairly recently with Mrs. Jackson, Michael's mum. Oh, yeah. And I, and I guess one of your concerns is what she would think of, of you if she watches this. I mean, what would you have to say to her? I'm Catherine. sorry if there's anything that comes out of this that are about her son that uh, is negative. Uh, never would that have been my intent, intent going into something like this to have anything develop that would be negative about Neverland, the animals, or, or her son. Never, never would I have gotten involved if that was their focus and it had known a, a head. I never would have gotten the other people involved and I never would have supported them. And she's aware of your book, isn't she, um, Rob? I, yeah, she signed. I had two copies when we met. I just gave her a signed copy and then she took the other copy and signed it thanking me for creating Neverland for her son and gave yeah. it back, gave that copy back to me. She, she told me she loved the ranch. She loved it there. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, yeah it was. But she, she's a person to forgive and she would see through all this anyway. She knows what, how media can be, especially with her son and her, well, all the, her, her whole family, you know. And um, yeah, we just wish her good health and any all good years. And oh, yeah. Catherine, Catherine is a very gracious person. And I, I thought the world of her when I met her and was with her. She just, very special lady. Yeah, she's very special. Michael used to say to me, in, I remember very clearly because my mum was dying of breast cancer and he, we were sat on the sofa together and he said to me, I don't know what, what I would do if anything happened to my, I used to call her mother, my mother, because uh, I couldn't handle that. And it was just ironic that he went before before yeah. she did. But for her to lose her son, because they were super close. I mean, yeah, yeah that was tough going. Anyway, let's, let's hope that this- yeah, Can you imagine how tough it's been on her? Unbelievable. If imagine. she didn't have his children to raise and be part of her life, it would have been as I think that helped her get through it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it will. And I, I you know, I hope Prince and Paris and Blanket see this. And uh, in my time, I went through about seeing about 10 different managers or PAs, and there's a certain amount of control factor. Now, there, there were some good ones and some bad ones. I mean, I'm not one to judge on who was good or bad because I didn't really know the government was on there, but. I, I kind of like D to V to definitely had is, is Michael's good interest at heart. And um, I can tell you a funny story about Neverland and Dieter is that getting hold of Michael Jackson is very difficult. You'd have to go through various people and bodyguard right. and so on. And sometimes I'd take calls and, and pass messages if I was with him and he would get hundreds of messages a day. Oh God. He, he, would, he would call back anything to do with the head of Disney. He would ring back straight away. Straight away he was on the phone and he was very well connected with that the Disney family and so on. Um, but I remember one particular day, uh, Dieter bought him, I think it was like the latest, it must be like the latest iPhone or back then, just coming out and it was gold plated. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Dieter reason that bought it for him to make sure that he could get hold of Michael whenever he wanted. Because communication with Michael Jackson was, was a, an issue. And at Neverland, when you call Neverland, you ring the number and you would be put on hold for an hour while they try and locate him. And he'd be on a car driving around and they would try all the different areas and it was an endless problem. And then you'd leave a message and hope they'll get back to you. So Dieter bought them his phone and he made sure, I think it was Dieter, it was gold plated, so it was attractive to Michael, you know. And then uh, later on that evening, Michael said to me, he said, uh, I hope they don't empty Neverland Lake. I said, why is that, Michael? Why, why would you be concerned if they got rid of the water at Neverland Lake? I said, well, they would find hundreds phones there where people will have bought me phones over the year and DJ would be saying Michael why don't you answer your phone I bought you why don't you answer the phone and then later on he's like oh, man that phone's at the bottom of the lake you know <laughs> don't tell him he just used to he was a it. rascal he, he was, was a rascal like, he didn't want people he said people used to get hold of his number and harass him all the you know constantly and he wanted his peace so he he just threw it in the lake so one day when they, they ever empty the lake they're going to find all these blackberries and mobile phones and iPhones there and <laughs> And bet, yeah. I bet they're all right there next to his bedroom, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the yeah, yeah, the, yeah, he he gave you, you know, his private cell phone number and, and uh, 
and you know, I was ran uh, bedroom numbers, ranch number. I had, I had a whole list of phone numbers, but you know, I didn't use them. I didn't want to bother. Hey, I used to remember it off by heart. I don't. It won't be an action anymore. But to get to Mike, we used to dial zero zero one nine zero five, and the zero zero one. Nine five five zero zero five. Does that sound about right? And um, that would get through to to his uh, PA, and then she'd pass the message on. Then, yeah, if he should pass them or not. I think zero zero one eight zero eight nine five five zero zero five. There you go. I think that's what it was. That was Michael Jackson for a number. But if it is now, I'll be in big trouble. But he's, you know, that was that, that's how much we used to ring him and, and know it off by heart. And uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. But that was a funny story. At the bottom of the lake, there'll be a lot of a uh, lot of interesting oh. opponents there. Ross, I, the so. I just I just wait for Michael to call me. You know, he was, he called me from Europe one time. He'd just gotten off stage from a concert. Uh, I think he said it was two o'clock in the morning over there or something. But he had to find out the status of some ride we were doing for. That's all he could think about. Oh, you know, hey Rob, what's the status? Where are we at on this ride? You know. He was so oh, yeah. into that park. He just, oh, when we were picking out the, the uh, animals for the carousel, well, first he picks out this 36 foot carousel with 30 animals on it. And we had these big posters of different animals that we made. There were, I don't, I don't know how many of them we made a lot. Okay, I, I, want, I like that one. I want that. I want, we're on the phone together. I want that one, Rob. I want that. Well, I saw real quick, said, Michael, we're running out of room on this carousel for these animals. Oh, really, Rob? What, what can we do? <laughs> I saw this one coming. I hated to say anything. I said, well, Michael, we build a larger carousel that has 60 animals on it. Okay, Rob, I want that one. Then it's that. Boom! Just like that, we double the amount of animals, and we just keep right on choosing animals till he filled it up with sixty animals. Spawn. It all explained away. I, I, when I said I couldn't expand my business and I couldn't franchise anymore because no one's done it in my industry, he said to me, "That's exactly why you've got to do it." He always had a way, way around of thinking and, and creativeness about him. But uh, well, thanks for joining me today, Rob. Like one more quick thing, Michael sure. never once. Asked me the price of anything I did for him. Never. That me. Never. He didn't, you know, okay, I want that too. <laughs> as long as it made everyone else happy, he was happy. You know, That's whatever he wanted. And then it was up to the accountants and Norma to figure out how to pay for it. Yeah. Whatever Michael was. But anyhow, yes, Matt, it's been a wonderful visit. I'm so glad we got to do this today. I, I, everything happens for a reason, Rob. And um, Michael used to always be a great believer in karma, that things will come around and bite them. It yes. took 20 years for Bashir, my Bashir, to get there. And let's hope changes will be made to this, what we're hearing about this documentary. It won't appear like we're we're hearing now. Well, and, it's and, good um, that I, Harry contacted you first and that yeah. you've already had that interaction. And Mark, with and Mark Lester is Michael's best friend in Charlotte. Yeah. That you had already had that input from him that it's supposed to be a I, I got very positive. I got it ready for the lawyers. Michael Jackson State contact me. They can have all the texts between me and Harry. Yeah. Reassure me, no, no, this won't be a Bashir job. This would be positive about Michael Jackson, his love of animals. I've got Shove the whole it lot. in their face, Matt. Shove Absolutely. it in their face. If they want it. If John Brank or anybody from the state contacts me, then I'll be happy to give up my time for free to be uh, the deposition or witness and shut this thing down because i've had enough of it now i really yeah. haven't i'm hoping it will be the pages, last it's full of lies and uh there's he was no, convinced the content of their documentary cannot be trusted uh, they cannot be trusted they, they've ruined their reputation so good luck to them i mean i they have no respect with me never will have they've, they've destroyed that opportunity to do something beautiful and have turned it into a ugly mess and I, I just i can't i can't respect them that's the sad thing isn't it because it is the Bashir thing if what he could have done with that footage could have been amazing and a legacy and had they yep. have had they spoke to everyone the right way and kept to their what you believe their word their narrative on on the story of it being 
totally positive and no negativity, you probably could have got them into Neverland in the end and convinced the new owner it was a possibility, you know. And now we know, you know, recently that Neverland has been remodernized and it's the fair rides are back again, things are back in, the train's back again, everything's been put back in place. And there would have been that chance now for you to say to Mr. Burkle, you can trust these guys, let them have half an hour to film. They've blown it. That's not going to happen now. I mean, yeah. that's it. You just want this thing not to air now, don't you? You've had enough of it. Like yeah. Larry's had enough of it. And Mark, the zookeeper, I mean, you yeah. can't say anything against him. He's the man looking after the animals. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And yeah, it's, just... it's a ridiculous subject of a program, I think, too. And I know from your point of view, someone's going to take an airplane from England with staff in the middle of COVID, the world's biggest crisis, and, and come to California and come to the valley, which is not easily accessible. To near the ranch to film, you're gonna think these guys are true to their word, aren't you? Why wouldn't you? Why would you doubt them? Go to all that expense and effort. Yeah, it's, I don't know. And to get on ITV, which is a big platform, prime time, they must have big plans. But let's see what happens. It's been a pleasure interviewing you, oh. and I wish it was about something more positive. But we will do some positive stuff in the future.